design for production cycle. Um, there's even uh, aspects of automated customization that's happening with that has happened with CAM, where you can have a, a file or a, a part that's parameterized, and then a customer can customize a part without having any real <laughs> manual inputs. Um, and obviously, one of the greatest benefits that we have been able to unlock with CAM is uh, very increased reliability. So, at this point, with, with the standard uh, computer-aided manufacturing processes, we're able to get thousands to hundreds of thousands of parts at the exact same spec every time. And that's really incredible and has really um, pushed industrial aid forward. So, additive manufacturing is just GAM. It's a subset of GAM, to be precise. It has all these same benefits, but it also has a, a kind of fatal flaw as I see it, which is the repeatability. With many people that I've talked to about additive manufacturing, one of the common problems is that from one day to the next, using the exact same input parameters, we end up with a part that has completely different quality, completely out of spec. And that's kind of the one big issue that it seems like everybody's trying to address with additive manufacturing. So, the reason that I believe this is because additive manufacturing is particularly a very a highly flexible, high speed, and high precision uh, technique. But to be able to provide adequate quality assurance for something that's so high flexibility and high speed, we also need to have a quality assurance me mechanism that is both higher speed and higher flexible, um, more highly flexible. So, why do we actually care about quality assurance and additive manufacturing? Kind of a dumb question, but um, additive manufacturing has some enormous gains. Um, huge reductions in part count, lead time, um, the ability to have a part printed by multiple <coughs> vendors rather than having to only have one specific vendor where you can get a part from. Um, NASA, Boeing, Rolls Royce, many big players really care about it added manufacturing, but they can't put their brands in people's lives on something that's not completely qualified and guaranteed to be safe. Um, I've heard from the guys at NASA today talking about how they can't send people up in a part that hasn't gone through inspection, and if the part doesn't pass inspection, it's scrapped. So we need to be able to design parts that are able to, to be both we need to design an additive system, an additive uh, quality assurance system that's able to take the benefits of additive without having this uh, qualification problems. So, why haven't we solved this? It's such a big problem. Uh, non destructive analysis, as if you saw the first speaker today, this, uh, this section is very difficult. There's a lot of new APS techniques that are being done, and a lot of really smart people working on it. But, the more detailed structures that you're trying to analyze, the harder it becomes to analyze them. And the less of the uh, smaller amount of actual techniques there are to do the analysis. So, and while with 3D printed parts, it's definitely possible to use um, various non structured analysis techniques, it's, there's a big benefit to being able to do in process monitoring, where we're actually watching the part as it prints and doing the analysis at that point. Um, a good example of this is if you're working, if you have a, if you start a 30 hour print line and you walk away five minutes later because you think that it's going well, and then you come back with some just a pool of uh, plastic rather than actual the part that you were expecting, you're going to be pretty sad. And the, the big thing about that isn't actually the, used, the material that was used up, that's actually the in most of the industrial machines, especially, <laughs> print time is much more valuable than the actual material that may be wasted. In the so failing early is a key uh, benefit that we can get if we're able to implement any process monitoring. So how do people solve this problem right now? Well, it's all about knowledge. Um, right now, it's just knowing the model, knowing the process, knowing the parameters, knowing the tool path generation, and then knowing the printer. 
And when you have all this knowledge, and not, which is the knowledge usually is handled by an operator. So when you have an operator that has all this knowledge, what it does is it enables them to actually just sit in the buffer frame. Uh, so <laughs> rather than actually, so I was at um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory it's a few months ago. Um, they did a big area out of manufacturing machine. I'm not sure if you guys heard of it, but they are the ones who recently were able to print a car. It's enormous. Um, and we were talking with them about some of the problems they're having with the machine. And the actual number one issue that they had was related to the fact that they had to have somebody watching the machine 100% of the time. Uh, they had a big red button, a big stop button, where if they saw a problem, rather than letting them print go, they would just hit the stop. Um, this was, this wasn't, their number one issue. It wasn't actually even related to necessarily quality problems as much as it was actually related to manpower. So how would we go about automating a, the design process from a model to the actual object that we go get out? Well, first we'll, we can start talking about actually how uh, the process is right now. Generally, you have a CAD program that generates a model. The model goes into a slicing engine with some other parameters which then outputs some sort of toolpath code, uh, often D code. And then that goes into the printer with some control parameters, firmware uh, settings, things of that sort. And finally, you get out your model. It's, it's a, there's a definite pattern where we have a set of inputs that feed into an application, but then have an output that then feeds into kind of the next application in the pipeline. It's a pretty good pipeline for replacing individual components. Any of these applications, any of the individual applications in this pipeline can be replaced without much effort. But it is not a very good uh, pipeline for tying all of your inputs to the generated output, which would be, in this case would be the problem. So the first step in automation is creating a consistent API. And what this means is when changes happen to a single input, it would be Input changes will be propagated throughout the whole system. Um, and you'll be able to see an immediate effect on the output. Uh, also, by operating on, rather than, rather than having an input of a single model, we operate on a kind of history of models. We're able to tie not just the current um, print data, but actual historical data to it, um, historical input to current output. So we can say that. We know that a model of this sort printed better with these printer settings, or we know that, um, yeah, we're able to basically tie certain inputs to the output itself and create uh, uh, information. So the next step to automation of quality assurance is actually to add in some sort of monitoring system. So if we go back to the, the example of a human monitoring the actual print, an operator sitting there, they're going to be looking at the print as it goes, and their eyes are going to actually be a, in this case, the monitor. They're going to be watching the printer and monitoring the process. Then their eyes are going to feed information to their brain, which is going to use its collective experience and knowledge to make a decision. Yes, this print's going well, or no, it's not. And then, of course, the uh, operator at that point has the option to uh, stop the print or let it be going. And actually create the feedback loop. As an operator sees more prints going well with a certain set of settings or a certain type of model, they're able to gain more knowledge and able to actually further reduce down the set of parameters that they're able to use and get tighter tolerances in their prints overall. So that's kind of the, the generals. Let's go into a little bit uh, more of an implementation that we've been working on at all the types. Um, so this is something that I've spent as Audrey was talking about, maybe in the past six to nine months working on um, some other things. And we actually, we have a user print out a mount, and then we mount a web camera directly above the print bed. Um, we monitor the print as it's progressing, literally watching the print. And then if we detect a failure, we notify the user saying, hey, we think something's going wrong, why don't you tell us if that's really the case or not. I'm going to talk about the FDM solution that we've been work, working on, but also there is a, we also have a binary dead solution. <coughs> so how do we do this? It's fairly simple right now. 
Um, the main idea is that we capture the slicing engine output, so usually this is to code and render it to an image. And then we also uh, inject G-code to move the printhead out of the way because the printhead is usually obscuring um, from the top down when you're using usually obscuring the active print in progress. Um, and then we take a snapshot and compare the two. So we have a, this, the webcam input and then we have the G-code and we compare the two and are make a decision on whether or not we think the print is progressing properly or not. Um, so I'm going to talk about just some of the components a little bit of each component. Um, so the first thing is a slicing engine where you're able to, um, because we're monitoring the print as it progresses and we're also actually monitoring the G-code as it's streamed over to the printer, we're able to see where exactly in a given print we're at. And so we can actually tell that your bust of Carl Sagan is being printed correctly, even if all you can see is this turtleneck. So the next step is G-code injection. Um, as I explained, usually in an FDM process, the print head is, will obscure the part that we actually want to do quality control of. And so we need to move the print head out of the way. And the way that we do this is by injecting G-code into the um, print stream to move the print head away, time that with a webcam snapshot, and then move the print, back, uh, move the print head back. This way we're able to get our actual image of what's going on. And then the final step of this process is the image processing. So by, we have the input image, we have our calculated G-code render, and then we are able to create a comparison map between the two. Um, and from this agreement map, we're able to <coughs> determine a level of confidence that either the print is going well or well, maybe it's failing. And then finally, we, at this step, we're at an early enough stage in our process that we're not going to stop the print automatically. Instead, we're going to ask for user input. Um, an experienced uh, technician is going to know a lot better if the print's really going well or not than our system right now. And so by getting their input, we're able to actually use that as a feedback into our system to further train the system to um, reinforce its concept of what's failing, what's a failure, and what's a success. So I talked about FDM, and also I mentioned the standard jet system, but really the big thing that people care about is metal. Um, metal is where a lot of the big industrial research is going, and it's one of the end goals of uh, in-process monitoring. And one of the things that we come across is that really to be able to accomplish metal um, in process monitoring successfully, we need more sensors. Um, just taking an image is not enough. And by having a lot more, a uh, much larger corpus of data to be working from, we're able to uh, implement machine learning on a corpus of data. So many different sensors can input much more data and it can be much more confident in our decisions and, and so forth. So as I explained with FDM, I explained our FDM system, the finder disk system is very similar. Um, all the same to identify a part, um, match it up with the uh, rendered, um, in this case it's not going to be too covered, probably like an STL, uh, not STL, a uh, SVG file, something of that sort. And then compare the two and find where there's and a metal system is really pretty similar. Um, we take the, the idea of just a camera inside a metal system, we'll identify a part and determine if there's issues. But like I said, also, there's more sensors that we could get involved. Um, as I explained earlier, good quality assurance, um, particularly from, especially as we want to get higher precision parts, requires a triangulation of data sources. <coughs> The more data we're able to get, the more confident we can be that things are progressing. But, um, you can think of this as having, you're going back to the technician. If you have a technician watching the print, they're also actually going to not just be watching, but they're going to be listening. They're going to be even maybe um, sensing the heat of the print as it progresses. And so we kind of want to make that human have superpowers. We want to give them so they can see into to the infrared or be able to hear ultrasound. And that's really the system that we want to design out. Um, 
So I've talked a bit about machine learning. Right now, machine learning gets us feature recognition. And that's, in this case, our feature is actually the failure. But it doesn't have to stop there. Machine learning means that we can actually start doing model analysis. We can, we can take the historic set of models that have been printed and we can say, hey, this model actually is probably going to fail. You should, in this case, thicken walls or change some, change some parameters in your model. And the same can go for slicing parameters, um, printer parameters, or even we can do something like uh, actual printer hardware failure detection. We will be able to tell that a thermistor is going to fail or that you know, gear slippage. Um, and we may be able to say that in the future, <coughs> Your thermistor has been going for six months. We know that your typical life cycle is around six months, and we're starting to see fluctuations, so you should probably replace it. Um, also, for somewhere like, like a big print bureau that may have multiple printers and maybe even multiple types of printers, um, we could even suggest a better printer. It's possible that the printer that they selected may not be the best printer for the cart that they want to print. And then the final step is, is actually operating on the experience. So, I've been talking about doing these kind of suggestions, but that's not all. We can actually do in situ um, changes to the prints. So once we have enough data, and once we're able to be processing the data in a reliable and quick fashion, we can actually see a failure before it occurs and correct. Um, this may be in the process of a binder jet system relaying a powder jet or cleaning a supply line. But it also could be on a laser system actually modulating laser power. Maybe we wanted for monitoring the weld bead size. And we've seen that for a wall of a particular thickness, if the weld bead is too big, maybe that's going to cause a failure. And we can actually modulate that as we're monitoring it. And this is closing the loop. So the additive manufacturing right now is kind of forfeit to this quality assurance problem. And but it doesn't mean once we're able to design out a quality assurance system that is faster and more flexible than, than the manufacturing system itself, we'll be able to close this loop. So once again, just kind of in summary, out of manufacturing is CAM. Um, and it has all of the benefits that CAM has, and I believe that it can also have the extreme repeatability that CAM has.